Okay, start recording the meeting. Uh, once again, thank you to uh, for uh, joining today for our lecture number six already in the middle of this module. And this week we only have uh, this lecture as Thursday is a uh, holiday. And uh, uh, of course we will respect that and carry on uh, next uh, week. And uh, today, we also have a quite heavy uh, slides here to cover one of the central topics within uh, economic geography um, and also uh, within evolutionary thinking in economic uh, geography. The topics of constructing regional advantage, related and unrelated variety. But before that, we have to recap a little bit the previous lecture and um, as the topics are interconnected and also the insights from today are fundamental to what we will discuss uh, towards the end of the month and um, and in the first lecture of June and last one. So then we'll be talking about place-based regional policies uh, and uh, strategic thinking within uh, the organization of the economic landscape, uh, which then will uh, open the way to discuss uh, smart specialization. So we are embracing now a more uh, regional approach within this model of evolution economic, evolutionary economic geography. And we are, however, we'll keep talking about firm dynamics, industrial dynamics. We are, uh, to some extent, uh, approaching going more close to regional innovation policies, regional developments uh, in the overall terms, and the development of, uh, of uh, uh, regions and territories in general. Um, however, then I will show you uh, what you can do if you prefer or, or if you sympathize with a more uh, business approach uh, within this topic that I, I, I have the feeling that you are also sympathetic regarding this, this perspective. So let's first uh, recap the previous lecture uh, that we end up by talking about resilience. And I place here resilience, resilience uh, within economic geography uh, and regional resilience through the lenses of evolutionary thinking, very much in line with what the, the literature offers to us uh, today. And th there, is, there is one strand of reasoning within this resilience uh, in economic geography that, that understands it as avoiding the path dependency uh, and, and going beyond the conceptualization of the path dependence as we uh, placed it, as we discussed it before. And they consider this resilience as a way of, as, as, as a, a strategy to move away from these established paths that we discussed that can have positive and negative uh, uh, effects as well, or be initially initially having positive effects and then eventually for a number of, of reasons, including historical events, can lead to a negative effect and eventually the decline of a firm, of an industry and of an entire region. However, those that are more, uh, that they are the, 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 the founders of uh, evolutionary economic geography, primarily within the European, uh, European uh, approach to economic geography, uh, such as Ron Bussman here, proposed the conceptualization of resilience. And I will most tell, of course, uh, they will propose that goes more in line with these concepts of evolutionary thinking within economic geography as path dependence. And, and lock ins and uh, spatial agglomerations of uh, economic activity, the clusters. So, uh, Bosman, uh, Bosman and others propose a conceptualization of regional resilience in which they value the historical uh, development paths of the region. So, they, they, contrary to what others argue, they do not intend to neglect this historical uh, uh, process and ways of. Uh, of, uh, of embracing the development, and they, they intend to, to bring them to understand how regions can become more resilient. So partly of this of this of the research that is currently being undertaken within the regional resilience is try to understand what can sustain the long-term development of regions. And this implies understanding how they were able to respond to certain shocks in the past. So uh, they, they embrace this historical process, means they embrace an evolutionary thinking. So 
placing this in terms of this evolution of economic geography, regional resilience is the ability of regions, it's that capacity to, to reorganize themselves, to reconfigure their socioeconomic structures, including institutional arrangements, uh, both uh, involving public and private entities to develop new uh, development paths, new grow paths. Grow is often the terminology used in the literature, but I often prefer the development as then we tend, if we build on this concept of sustainable development, we discuss also, we bring other pillars uh, uh, that are essential to sustain the society in today's economical, the social and the ecological ones. So understanding this uh, resilience as this capacity, okay, to reconfigure, reconfigure the structures of a region in order to, to be able to overcome uh, at a, a stagnation phase or, a, or to, to embrace a new path able to place them in again in the development in the in the in the more prosperous uh, path and uh, try now to, to stick to this evolutionary thinking in economic geography and again this is very much about what is going on in terms of research and ideas also to to inspire you to explore uh, to explore our case studies or also to, to, to call your attention for when you are focusing one specific concept, try not to neglect the, the try not to let other concepts and build a line of reasoning in which you try to, to, to justify why you are selecting certain concept and uh, highlight that others exist that could eventually be useful, be useful in this or another context, but we decided to embrace that one. So you have to, and, and it's an important exercise within this model and also in other models, you are certainly aware of that, that is important to justify this line of reasoning. And again, this regional resilience approach within economic geography is very much the result of uh, researchers like me, like you, and like all the others working at the university to or, or continue developing our own career path or also to embrace topics that are becoming more trendy and the critic this often leads to some critics as you will see in the next slide and we only uh, very very lightly explore it before so the role here of economic geography is trying to understand how regions territories overall respond to these shocks or being them related with the natural disasters or being them essentially man-made and the result of um, of uh, the activity uh, within society and also the disruptions within the uh, economic landscape. For example, the disruptions of suppliers as the result of, uh, of uh, natural disasters in, 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 in Southeast Asia or, or, or other kind of uh, shocks in, in Latin America that compromise the, norm, the normal flow of goods or of raw materials within a, a large supply chain can also be related with the the, the, the the decay of some the decay of some technologies uh, or the emergence of an other other technology that force certain firms or, or lead certain firms to to enter this this re, re, disruption process and recall for uh, other kind of measures and. Uh, because we embrace geography and understanding of these uh, uh, dynamics, these flows across territories, part of the, the research that is currently undertaken within res regional resilience is also to understand process of uh, deindustrialization or neo-industrialization, how, how or how could certain region uh, uh, completely change the structure of the industry from the traditional one to a more high tech uh, industry. For example, so we are talking here about a neo uh, industrialization process or, or how they embrace a completely transformation of the economic landscape. And they went from an industrialized region to a service oriented or knowledge based economy, uh, regional economy, for example. And very much also understanding uh, how regions uh, respond to uh, to economic uh, recessions that uh, have been happen uh, happen uh, across the world in the past uh, decades, and uh, I I try here in a completely. Uh, uh, by embracing a different, a multidisciplinary approach, bringing lessons from other disciplines, try to bring here in, in, in a, a parallelism with what's going on, for example, in the resilience, uh, in um, flood resilience management within urban areas. If we think about how 
cities in Europe and elsewhere in the world, in Southeast Asia and in Indonesia, for example, very prone to floods, how they, they embrace resilience. They do not, of course, focus primarily on economic activity, but the economic activity is fundamental for different reasons when they implement their resilience strategies. Hamburg is, to some extent, a positive example. There are some, some uh, comments in this publication here that places both the positive and the negative aspects of the resilience strategy in Hamburg, very close to Kiel. So they, they, the prime goal is to protect, in this case here, I'm just focused on the Hafen city part, uh, 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 protecting the area against floods, but of course they also have in mind solidifying or, or, or preparing, uh, preparing the, the economic activities that take place take place in this part of in part of the city. So there is a, a, a need to to understand resilience. That the lesson the lesson here from this publication and the overall understanding of um, uh, flood protection in urban areas is that. Eventually, the economy is not the prime goal, but in the end, if they are protecting the communities that live there, they are also protecting the economic activities. However, they have a, a, a what we can say a pioneer resilience approach in the, in, the, in the urban context. Occasionally, some floods still occur. We have here a picture extracted from this publication from in different moments, and one in which uh, in 2007, 2007 uh, a flood occurred in this part of the Hafen city. What the publication, what these uh, findings tell us is that to embrace resilience will be embraced from a multidisciplinary perspective, not only from the planning perspective or economic geography, we have to embrace resilience if we truly want to talk about uh, resilient urban areas or resilient regions, we have to embrace from a multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary perspective and place it at the core of political discussions as well as well as within the reorganization of, in, uh, of institutions or the overall territorial governance of a specific territory again. The same if we, we, if we bring this to a more evolution economic geography approach, Again, resilience is precisely understanding how a region, how the capacity of a region to sustain this long-term development is not only about responding to shocks when they occur, but also preparing the region to be more okay, resilient, to be better prepared to, response, to respond to these challenges. Eventually, learning from the past, I may conquer uh, with this evolutionary uh, thinking within a resilience, learning from the past, learning how they were able to respond or not to these shocks will uh, uh, better sustain their development towards the future. So again, it's this capacity of a region to respond positively to short-term shocks, but in a long-term perspective. And again, not only about to respond what to, 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 to what can happen in a specific moment, but also anticipate possible negative impacts of these uh, shocks. Essentially, this is uh, more challenging when we are talking about natural disasters. We, we, we also there are a lot of forecasts and, and uh, uh, scenario building in this context, anticipating the negative consequences of such natural disasters is more challenging than anticipating the negative consequence of economical crisis. Eventually here, the past dependency or learning from the past will uh, uh, eventually lead to a more robust approaches within regional resilience. And again, the literature within economic geography highlights very much as the literature within spatial planning, for example, highlights that resilience is not a marathon, it's an ongoing process. We discussed this uh, before, and it's about moving from uh, uh, one specific condition to a new one in which these negative impacts, this, this, the negative impacts resulting from these shocks are easily, uh, or to some extent, easily overcome. And I bring again an example from, from Hamburg uh, and, and uh, the framework they, they, they um, elaborated to respond to, to, uh, to, uh, to, to the flood in context, uh, in this urban context. So they do not intend to respond to the shock to the flood when they occur, but also anticipate them and be prepared. That's what the resilience means here, to be prepared to, to, to reduce the negative impacts of this flood. And they, this goes from implementing some technical measures and to, to raising awareness regarding uh, 
uh, regarding the issue regarding floods and the curious curious here is also embracing the uh, the water not as a, as a as an imminent negative uh, element that exists in the landscape, but but as an asset that can be uh, can be uh, used in favor of uh, the development of the local communities uh, overall. So it's about robustness to reduce this flood probability, for instance, and adapt the adaptability of being, being able to to reduce the consequences, the negative consequences of uh, flooding events. This again implies also. Uh, 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 the involvement of local communities, public and private stakeholders. The same goes to uh, regional resilience. When we are talking about uh, regional resilience, uh, eventually within economic crisis, the economic activity will be more uh, will be highly uh, uh, highly impacted by this economic crisis. The industry, for example, some of them they will be able to transform themselves into now activity now industrial sectors they, they will want to be able to renew their their uh, their processes and enter a new development path but within industry others they won't be able to embrace a new uh, industrialization path and uh, and they will, this will lead uh, to other economic activities such as tourism or these uh, uh, brownfield areas will lead to different kind of economic activities on housing or uh, activities in support of the leisure economy, for example, or, or uh, also in support of economic activities by, by uh, transforming these uh, old industrial uh, parts of, uh, of a certain of a certain region to to host um, to, to host uh, new activities uh, and, and uh, research centers for example or centers that are intended to support the development of uh, new business so it's about adapting adapting is being resilient the capacity to respond to change and the capacity also to anticipate to these possible changes in the in the near uh, future and to permanently avoid uh, uh, avoid a stage of stagnation that's also very important uh, within these resilience strategies uh, uh, particularly in, in industrial areas is this capacity of when this the uh, a certain event arrives they will easily overcome it overcome it and then avoid a stagnation process and eventually uh, an increase of unemployment rates and the complete uh, uh, bankruptcy of, of firms or regional resilience it also uh, touched upon this its capacity of uh, of being able to respond as fast as possible to these uh, to these shocks and uh, what i found in the literature and this is a part of my critique it also uh, building on on others is that this sounds very effective all these possibilities of developing of pushing forward and i'm didn't bring in a specific case of regional resilience related to economic geography it still a lot of research needs to be taken in this context everything seems very very effective however there are a number of critics that tell that regional resilience is very much about importing a concept that uh, has been gaining some some track in uh, research within uh, spatial planning for example and also within the uh, uh, urban policies but yet it's still a uh, it's still remaining very much under research within economic geography and it truly impacts upon this organization of the economic landscape or how the, res the resilience concept can support a structural change in, uh, in, uh, in regions, for example. And the critic remains very much in this level uh, that, that is still a very uh, uh, immature concept within economic geography that uh, that is not it has not been enough explored in interconnection with already solidified concepts within economic geography, such as those we'll explore further, constructing regional advantage, knowledge-based policy platforms, and related and unrelated variety within this knowledge exchange. And, and the literature still, the critics pointed out that the current discussions within resi regional resilience, they simply place this concept in their narrative, but basically they are continue touching upon or the uh, or, or what we discussed earlier, the path dependency theory or different uh, stages in which a path can be created. So it's very much more of the same, except that they are bringing a concept that is considered a hot concept, a hot topic uh, within uh, within the current discussions. And for your further readings. Um, 
I found these two publications very useful. I pointed out them earlier, so we are trying to recap here. And uh, both the lessons, lessons from here, a lot of, 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 of uh, cases, uh, cases of uh, conceptualizations within both. But the overall message is that they, there's, in both you see this call to embrace resilience from an overarching perspective. From a multidisciplinary perspective, they suggest that resilience cannot be achieved without the involvement of local communities or without the involvement of uh, um, of uh, uh, private uh, uh, private stakeholders, so and there's the need also to build a political a political discourse around the need of uh, uh, preparing uh, regions to uh, uh, event to possible shocks in the future, and. Uh, lessons a lot of lessons can be drawn from the urban and regional resilience discourse. Uh, uh, to, to a, a bit and then be transcribed to economic geography. And again, that is this, this uh, call to understanding uh, regional resilience without neglecting the, the social economic conditions of a territory, but also the spatial conditions of it. This will eventually help to prepare better against those uh, disasters, those shocks that are more natural, natural based, and, but also those that, that are the result of uh, economic uh, economic activities and there and there are different reasons why a, a region uh, can implement or should implement uh, uh, a resilience strategy it can also can be related with the disruption of industrialization uh, patterns can be related with out migration for example or demographic changes that can lead to a, to a, a, um, them to be placed within a lock-in con context and then resilience, regional resilience strategies will help to overcome the negative aspects of these lock-in uh, processes. And uh, basically, this is what I intended to say to recap the, the previous lecture to all these publications. And I invite you to, re to, to read, the, in particular, these uh, chapters I aligned here. And they will provide you very clear explanations of, uh, of this regional resilience concept within economic uh, geography and the relation to path the path dependency theory and be aware that part uh, some researchers they, they explore the concept aligned with path dependency theory so summarizing it that they highlight the historical processes that they suggest we should not neglect this historical process in understanding how a region can become more resilient and others suggest that to truly embrace resilience we have to to uh, to to uh, to simply uh, put aside this path dependency theory and embrace a new thinking capable of responding to uh, uh, these, um, these unforeseen circumstances. And uh, before moving forward, uh, I would like uh, to ask if you have any question, if you would like to, to intervene to suggest possible, uh, possible avenues of research, if you have uh, one idea that you would like to see explored the, within this uh, resilience concept. Anything from your side at the moment? So then if not, uh, then we, we carry on. Someone? I just wanted to say all right. <laughs> okay, all right then. Um, all fine. So please uh, read the literature. That is, is very important that, uh, that uh, now you have some, uh, well, probably not three days, uh, not off days, but uh, the, the, at least within this model, you can uh, use these uh, next, uh, next two hours um, of Thursday to, to catch up with some of the readings. So um, I got the impression that uh, maybe I'm wrong, that uh, some of you are very sympathetic towards this business side of uh, within economic geography. Um, I mean that that uh, I see that you are interested in all these startup dynamics uh, or, or dynamics within supply chains, for example. So, and and in, in a, as as a as as the lecture and then and also to some extent expert within economic geography, you can embrace more this business side, but you have to you should not neglect the geographical aspect what i'm what i'm trying to to say here so when we talk about resilience we can talk about different aspects you talk about flood or response to natural disasters you can also uh, bring the concept again when you try to understand supply chains if there is a disruption within supply chains and then this leads you to a more business side of the resilience of the resilience concept and i'm here bringing the resilience because we just discussed this uh, recently but you can also 
place this more business side uh, within the other uh, other concepts of evolution economic geography that we discussed earlier and we will discuss further so let's for example and here i'm creating hypothesis i'm not coming to you with a, with any concrete concrete response to, to anything just just hypothesis if you if you are sympathetic towards an understanding of uh, supply chains involving uh, uh, technolo technological equipment or involving uh, uh, um, agriculture uh, uh, products or crops, uh, better using the better term, so you can you can discuss about this disruption in supply chains, and you can do that from a pure business side. But we are within economic geography, so what you need to do in this, in this context is placing it within. A geographical thinking and ideally within this evolutionary perspective. I mentioned to you in one of the lectures, this evolutionary perspective often uh, establish a time frame of analysis. You have a certain starting point in which one region, for instance, uh, was once a dynamic activity, uh, was once a, a dynamic economic landscape, a number of industries, were placed in this region, they were capable of, of supplying other territories, they were also capable of supplying their, uh, their endogenous market, market as well, but they entered a, dis a disruption and, and this uh, impacted them in, in the com coming decades. So within evolution perspective, you can put this within a specific time frame. And if you an uh, analyze the evolution towards the year from one stage of development to another, understanding if they enter path development, if they succeed in this development path, if they eventually enter a negative lock-in and eventually a disruption. So there are different elements that you can access. And this, this immediately places you in a territory, it places you in evolutionary context and also in a geographical one, although you are more focused on firm dynamics, on industrial dynamics, and less than on these regional development policies, for instance. Okay, then, then the supply chain offers you uh, different, uh, different uh, possibilities of research in this context uh, and can be regarding as a disruption, uh, an approval of, of a specifically supply chain law can also lead to, to uh, different areas of research, the approval of an environmental law that can impact the, the supply chains globally. So we are talking about firm and industrial dynamics as the, con uh, this will so the, the decisions of, uh, of uh, policy makers will impact firm and industrial dynamics, patterning, patterning, uh, placing it in this order, which eventually will lead or not to a structural change. So, so try to if if uh, even if you focus on a more business side of uh, a certain a certain activity or a firm say, or a firm or a sector you have have plenty of opportunities to engage with evolution economic geography in this context by bringing these concepts that we've been exploring uh, uh, recently so and within the supply chains that's again I, one example there are some key questions that you can ask if you try to access why this 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 large uh, company decided to 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 now to contract suppliers elsewhere than their common standard so they use it to 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 import their their uh, part of their the elements that are needed to finalize their products from a certain region but for some reason they decided to start importing from other suppliers so you have to understand why they decided to do this is this merely a pure business approach because of costs reduction, for example, or because there's an optimal uh, technology being developed elsewhere. So we have to understand why these firms are decided to, 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 to shift their suppliers. But you can also understand what these uh, other regions that are supplying the big companies, what happened there that, that eventually led them to have a, a more optimal product, for example. Maybe there was a, a governance decision that helped the companies to develop it or to, to, to innovate, for example. So there are the different strands of reasoning that you can explore when you are, uh, when you are focus on a more business side of the economic landscape. You ask questions about why this is happening and where. So they decided to, 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 to shift their suppliers to where? To Southeast Asia, to Latin America, to elsewhere in the world. And you are trying to understand this. All these eventually lead to a new development path in the, in the, in the, 
in the territory where the, where the large firm is located, but can also lead to a new path in the in the in the country in the geography of these new suppliers. So a number of, of possibilities here to explore. And the supply chains offers you a lot of possibilities in this context. And you have supply chains globally that, that they, 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 they go from, from Central Europe to South America and Southeast Asia, but you also have supply chains within Europe, for example, in the textile, textile uh, sector, automobile as well, and in many other sectors. And the supply chains is, is, a, is a backbone to understand the global economic landscape but be aware that if you embrace uh, uh, topics such as the supply chain the literature that that exists is is slightly different than the one that you have for example in your all arts platform there are literature within economic geography that explores the supply chains but more focus on on firm dynamics and 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 the, the how this impacts or the role of firms and industries then you may need to uh, to check other uh, type of literature and also the approach of resilience in this context is very much focused on the on, on the supply chain itself and how can move from one original state to a new one in which uh, they remain sustainable towards the future. I mean, the supply chain, the supply chain and the dynamics within these supply chains. Another call for attention is that you have to place your findings also against ongoing debates. Ideally, this will lead to, 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 to a better assessment of your studies within this model and also, believe me, in other context eventually even in your professional uh, activity further on so if you place your findings within current debates you are you are you, you are contributing timely to a certain discussion and in in the european context if you discuss about supply chains you should bring the current debates within the european industrial strategy or bring, if you are focusing in germany for example you should also try to understand what this the uh, new supply chain law can impact uh, the 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 the, um, the uh, industrial activity within Germany, and eventually, can this this supply chain uh, law in Germany inspire other countries to implement uh, uh, such a law as well? So, if you you place, you should should I recommend you to place your findings against uh, current debates, and uh, and uh, if we think about resilience, and this is just this has been published last week, so. We are really touching upon here a very timely uh, discussion. Uh, there is this core preoccupation within the European Union, like it or not, being more critical towards their own organization or not. That uh, that intention is to to build a more resilient single market. This means trying to prepare the single market, the the, the common market within the European member states, and 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 uh, prepare it to eventually possible future crisis. So trying to make sense here of what we have been just discussing. This can eventually, uh, resilience can be applied to support a structural change in, in, in the completely changing of, of activities or, or, or renewal traditional activities, but essentially to be able to respond to future crises. And interesting, there is an emphasis in this new European industrial strategy to small and medium, to small and medium size enterprises or companies. So, uh, I, in, in my uh, based on Watson, the knowledge I have regarding past industrial uh, strategies, there is now a more focus on the seems that the small small is better, and this within small contexts, uh, the small enterprises that is also this is also applied in the geographical context. Sometimes small uh, towns and or, or urban centers are are more resilient, so they they have less complex structures in terms of institutions and governance arrangements that make them more capable of responding to crisis. This is currently being embraced within industrial strategies. Small and medium-sized enterprises are more likely to be able to respond to future crises in a more efficient manner. And again, all the discourse within this uh, 2020 industrial strategy updated just uh, just uh, a couple of days ago is very much focused on what we just discussed the resilience to disruptions okay i hope this uh, to some extent solidify what i have been uh, telling uh, to you sometimes not in the most most uh, um, assertive uh, discourse and this requires investing in key strategic areas and investing in key strategic areas or in, in regional uh, qualities is a prime, is, is a central topic within constructing regional advantage that we'll discuss next. 
some heads up here also if you are in more interested in these green aspects of the economic landscape there is a very nice uh, one hour uh, lecture uh, on youtube uh, this um, was also uh, uh, from some, some some days ago by Professor Michaela Tripli from the University of Vienna. She discussed partly what we discussed in the, our previous uh, lectures: how to to embrace and how to 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 how territories can embrace this green industrial path development. So, uh, I also I'm supportive of uh, of of bringing new. Uh, forms of uh, of learning into into your essays and the, in the, and and uh, into your responses when you have a, an assignment for example so not only in literature but also podcasts and videos you are also very very helpful and also in this uh, this regarding do you want to do you have uh, some question here some 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 more practical issue regarding uh, essays or, or um, future assignments something you would like to to share so if not, we carry on. And um, uh, uh, two, two, two slides here before, before we do a break. So we're entering now construct, constructing a regional advantage. And the best way to place this, why we are discussing this concept, another concept within evolution economic geography. And, and try to place it again against what everything we have been we have been discussing here original resilience path dependency theory lock-ins clusters sustainable development as well so we this construction regional advantage in one hand can be understood as as, as a strategy to help regions to overcome uh, stagnation phases to help them to to uh, to embrace their uh, endogenous capacities to overcome uh, a lot negative lock-ins for instance and and uh, and and then if i build on what i uh, on on the resilience concept what robert ansick uh, writes is that these concepts of of uh, of or uh, within evolution economic geography, construct regional advantage, path dependence, relative variety, they also have been used to discuss or to theorize about regional adaptation. So that is, is, is one of, of the researchers that pointed out critics to regional resiliency. If you recall the slide I just presented you before, because Robert Hansig uh, uh, suggests that these concepts more rooted within economic geography with a serious theorization behind them, they are better capable of understanding how regions can adapt and can respond to these shocks. So now we put aside the concept of resilience and we embrace it, uh, and we embrace constructing regional advantage. And everything almost started, although the, this concept has been discussed uh, uh, for quite some years within the European context, uh, the constructing regional advantage as concept is the result of the work of, uh, of a number of researchers in the, in the request from the European Commission that try to, to, to build new ways of supporting the European cohesion policy. So this constructing regional advantage, as well as the topics we will discuss next, uh, next lectures, place-based policies and smart specialization are very much uh, uh, policy-driven concepts. So they, they, they have been polished through policies and there is a, 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 a virtual cycle uh, academic research feeds uh, the policies and the applicability of these policies eventually recall for uh, rethinking of research and the concepts are again theorized and better constructed and we are talking about uh, socially constructed concepts so this, this, the concept of constructing regional advantage is the result of this exchange between researchers and policy makers as well. And the central condition to understanding this constructing regional advantage is the word precisely advantage. And, uh, and the understanding we hold now these days about constructing regional advantage is the result of the combination of, of the learnings from comparative and competitive advantage. So this requires some, 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 uh, some relaxed mind to understand these uh, these uh, two 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 approaches within gaining an advantage in a territorial context, and uh, for that I think it's better if we do a five minutes break before we embrace uh, uh, these these concepts towards the final constructed or constructing regional advantage. So let's do five minutes break, and uh, I will see you next.
All right, then we are back to fully embrace this uh, this uh, second part, focus on constructing regional advantage and the related concepts. And the starting point is uh, uh, the approach by David Ricardo, a classic economist and the trade theory, and uh, the approach of David Ricardo towards the comparative advantage. That means that regions have been uh, regions have been always a focus of e if economists, mo mostly those that try to understand uh, development uh, development dynamics within within regions, and uh, within these ideas of David Ricardo, uh, the comparative advantage emerged, in which th they try to understand to what extent the the, the resources uh, uh, that exist in one region, the capacities, what what is often called by geographers the special qualities of regions, uh, uh, support that support them or give them an advantage comparatively to others. An example is better in this context. Uh, if we think about uh, our cotton goods, uh, they have a comparative advantage in terms of production uh, or a comparative production advantage in Northwest England. Means this, this geography here, this territory is better equipped, has better capacities or qualities to produce cotton. The same goes, for example, for port wine in Northern Portugal. This, this geography, Northern Portugal region, is better prepared in terms of, of capacity, sometimes related with the physical environment. Uh, they have better qualities, uh, 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 labor force, skilled labor force, that gives them a comparative advantage compared to other regions to produce this specific good. Okay, so overall definition, they can produce that good in this and in the currently context or deliver that service at a lower relative opportunity cost in comparison to other regions. So this uh, to a, an example here and I will return to this. So what the Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage tell us is that or, or suggest that countries should, should specialize in one production uh, in the production of a specific goods. Even they called they could also produce other type of goods, but in comparison to other regions, they have an advantage in specifically focus on the production of that specific good. So the, uh, the key word within this comparative advantage is specialization and all this discourse that, that exists within, for example, European Union, but also in other parts of the world about uh, uh, um, specialized regions very much results of these insights from Ricardo's theory. And I would like to, to invite you to, to think one of example of this possible comparative advantage, even though I have to alert you that is, is a concept that is, is uh, no longer, uh, well, it's still debated to some extent, but has been overtaken by what we'll discuss next, competitive advantage and also this constructive regional advantage. Do you have an example that you would like to share about this comparative of the advantage of a of a region uh, within Germany, for example, that that maybe ex is escaping escape me, and then you have you have some knowledge. Uh, Do you like to elaborate in, in a comparative advantage that that may occurs you eventually wrong? There is no rights or wrongs in this context. Is is that something that call, call alert you? Yes, Christian. Um, I have no example, but I've got a question. Um, does labor costs for workers include uh, regional advantage or comparative advantage? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it eventually will. Uh, yeah, the, the the labor costs can will will come within this opportunity cost of producing that good, or or in this case can lead to a comparative advantage as they have the labor is is uh, uh, will lead them to have a relative opportunity cost in comparison to others but can also uh, play a role in their competitive advantage and then so we step towards the next concept by by building on the failures and uh, Within research, this is, and I will return to your to your question here. Within the uh, research, uh, many times there are the critics towards one concept or the failures of that concept lead to uh, the emergence of others. And then, in uh, based on this, on this, uh, some some partly of the failures of of. Uh, of the comparative advantage concept, the competitive advantage emerged. And in this context, the role of labor being labor intensive, intensive goods and, uh, and the, the, the uh, 
the availability of labor and then the cost of labor lead to a competitive advantage of regions. So they do play a role in bringing an advantage to a regional context. I hope this, to some extent, answers your question. Uh, a true uh, in-depth analysis, this requires an analysis of the labor costs itself within economic geography. Sometimes the discussions just go within understanding uh, the, 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 the role of labor availability or the cost of this labor in giving an advantage, a competitive advantage to a certain region. And the discourse currently is more focused on competitive advantage, very much as the result of an evolution of the economic thinking. Uh, and um, the the, the, the the seminal work of Michael Porter, the uh, regional competitive advantage uh, or the competitive advantage of nations in this in this context. So so from a comparative advantage, there was an evolution of discourse in terms of regional development and advantage of regions towards this competitive advantage. So and and uh, uh, what what happens in this context is that that countries start to understanding they have an advantage because they use more intensive labor, which helps helps them to to have a more favorably favorable position towards exportations. Others they have uh, they find a competitive an advantage because they use more. Uh, uh, they are more technologically advanced and they take an advantage of these uh, development technologies. However, a paradox occurred when the same region, the same geography start, started exported, uh, exporting uh, goods. They were both they were both labor intensive as well as technological intensive. So this disrupted the definition of the concept of competitive advantage, which which initially made a distinction between one region can only become competitive or th through labor intensive or through technological ad advancements. However, because the world continues in evolution, the, the, the flows of knowledge, the flows of the development of technologies, and, and because of the inexistence of, of borders in this context, these same territories they start gaining advantage in both aspects labor and technological uh, and technological uh, uh, advancements as well and in this context also the the relationship between firms which have been neglected earlier uh, uh, in in the literature they start also playing in a role in giving a more competitive advantage to to industries so the the, the discourse about understanding the interfirm relationships and the importance of the, the uh, um, local markets and not only the distant markets in the competitiveness uh, discourse also gained some traction in this in this context. So the, 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 there was an evolution of discourse towards an understanding of competitiveness more uh, be, behind a, a position of firms towards exportation, but also understanding that the internal market also plays a role in giving them an advantage. So from a global competitive advantage discourse, we start uh, uh, with, uh, uh, within economic geography, there was also uh, an understanding that this competitiveness also occurs within the say, within one region because of these inter-firm relationships and also within uh, and across across regions within the same uh, the same geography, the same territory. And and uh, in a sense, trying to summarize both. The comparative advantage and the competitive adva advantage, both the, the focus was more or in labor intensive or technologically intensive activities. And the advantage here is that, that, that what is the advantage is giving to these, to these regions a capacity to produce something in a way that can not that easily be copied by others. Okay, this was this was more more, more uh, easy to be explained if we were for example in the beginning of the 80s but now we, we are in another we are in another century and there the digital revolution impacted and disrupted all these supply chains so it is very tricky to explain the, the the usefulness of these two concepts comparative advantage and competitive advantage in isolated manner because everything is very much interlinked and countries or regions, they still have a competitive advantage. It's still uh, more beneficial for Northern, Port or Northern Portugal, the valley, the Toro Valley to produce port wine in comparison to a region in Australia. They still have this comparative advantage. Eventually, because the labor has some skills in, in collecting the grapes, for example, gives them a competitive advantage. So 
what I'm telling you here, here is that currently to truly understand the economic uh, landscape, the dynamics in economic landscape, we should not neglect concepts and understanding the advantage, again, the advantage here in the sense that what these concepts can tell us uh, uh, regarding uh, this regional advantage overall and not only comparative, comparatively or competitively. However, still there is still a distinction in the literature that that clearly uh, places both comparative and competitive focus on labor intensive and technological intensive, and they pointed out the failures of both by suggesting that they were not capable of embracing or dealing with innovation as the result of knowledge exchanges. And here now I bring two different so I, uh, two different variables, knowledge and innovation, and then we'll stick to them towards the end of the lecture. So. And, and this is also when you are building your story, your narrative, your line of reasoning, it, this is also, it will occur and we'll see them flowing through your essays, for example. So there is a, an evolution as the, as the world evolves, the approach in research also evolves. So we pointed out the failures of the comparative advantage, they couldn't, they couldn't deal with technological developments. And then the failures of competitive, the competitive advantage, they, they, when, when uh, advanced economies starting position, positioning themselves through labor intensive and technological intensive. And then the discourse came to acknowledge that, well, they have been neglecting innovation and a knowledge exchange process that lead to innovation. And then the concept of constructed advantage emerged within the literature and within policy debates as well. And, and Basically, the constructing advantage tries to embrace uh, uh, these new dynamics, the new dynamics on ev of innovation, and use them to exploit, to explore, to, to, to advance or to pave the way to new development paths, to economic growth in general. So, so innovation and knowledge are placed as a central concepts within constructed advantage. Um, and, and, and the, the constructed advantage to truly understand it in, implies an overarching understanding as very much as in other concepts, such as the one, the resilience. We cannot truly talk about constructing a regional advantage within one region uh, by neglecting sectors of society. So to talk about regional advantage, we have to focus on economic activities. We have to, to, to understand the interfirm interactions. We have to understand how knowledge uh, across, across firms is integrated in different process to what extent this knowledge exchange lead to new innovation processes, how knowledge impacts uh, impacts business networks, for example, make them stronger, lead to new kind of new, new business activities, can can lead to 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 different to the creation of the new business models, you know. So it's important to understand how knowledge the the role of knowledge in leading to innovation and to solidify paths or creating new development paths. It's also important to understand the governance context. Is is are the institutions in that region favoring innovation, for, for example? Are the, the policymakers aware that innovation plays a role in economic development as well? Are they interested in positioning the region in an internationally competitive arena, for example? These elements are fundamental. And, and, and then the literature suggests that to truly build, to truly construct an advantage in the region, these dimensions cannot be neglected. And also the quality of the infrastructures are these regions equipped with universities, research centers? Do they have enough funding to continue supporting, uh, uh, supporting research that eventually will lead to, to knowledge ex exchanges across these institutions, uh, the exchange uh, of knowledge between, uh, uh, between research centers, universities, and the private sector firms and industrial sectors as well, and also understanding the role of, of more, uh, more uh, more, uh, more intangible elements coming from the cultural background of the community to what extent that approach towards entrepreneurship, for example, impact the development of new business models uh, or impact the development of uh, entrepreneurship. And this, we discussed that entrepreneurship in this context very much is influenced by po existing policies coming from the governance structures, but also by the, by the attitude, by the approach of the owner own uh, entrepreneur. So 
again, an overarching concept to understand regional advantage, we have to embrace these different dimensions within society. So try to come with a definition. Constrict advantage is a strategic policy perspective of practical use of business firms, associations, academics, and policymakers. So okay, we bring these elements of the economic landscape together. And this is about optimizing global knowledge flows. So we're talking about knowledge flows and we are talking, try, I will try to, to simplify this knowledge uh, within, a, within a economic geography and within the concept. And then uh, the, the constrict advantage is about understanding how these flows of knowledge uh, support support a region to become to enter or a new path of development help them to to innovate and then position themselves in comparison to others so the concept does not neglect the competitive advantage from a regard does not neglect the competitive advantage brings them together and emphasizes innovation processes as the result of knowledge flows and I hopefully an example that I will bring further on will help in this context. So there is very much a relation approach in this context as well as an evolutionary uh, approach. And this is very much about um, focus on key strategic areas as we, we, uh, we pointed out, part of the critique in regional resilience uh, is important to focus on key strategic areas. It's also important to focus on regional qualities or, or, or on the capabilities of the region in this context. But the literature suggests that to truly embrace uh, regional advantage, we need uh, different within different sectors of society, and we, we need a plat industrial platforms that will sustain uh, there are the genesis of the knowledge. We need the so-called triple helix, means that the relationship between universities, research centers, industry, there's a mistake here, uh, industry and the governance structure. So we need a platform of stakeholders, both public and, pi and private. Without them, it's not possible to truly construct an advantage within the region. And we need the political support. Uh, including here some uh, the, 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 the policy making perspectives that involve or the support towards economy, for example, supporting investment attraction, supporting talent attraction, we discussed this earlier, and improving the infrastructure, which will then lead to improving the quality of, 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 of the offers, of the assets of this region. Okay, so, so in comparison to, to com in comparison to competitive advantage and a comparative advantage here, the geography, the territory, the advantage of this territory, the assets, as well as the narratives resulting from this, this uh, more cultural aspects of the community, the narratives that exist towards the advantage of, of creating our own business, for example, or, or or, or, or the failures of embracing a business, all of these more intangible elements, they play a role in constructing regional advantage. So we have a business side perspective and we have clearly an, a, a geographical perspective when we discuss this, this concept. And uh, the regional advantage as a concept emphasizes, uh, puts places an emphasis on the, on the advantage of, uh, of, uh, of the region and suggest that this advantage does not emerge, emerge spontaneously, uh, even if they are within the cluster. They are, the, the advantage results from, from a, a proactive partnership, proactive collaborations, proactive exchange of knowledge involving different actors, public and private. And here the private I place, the firms, the business sector, okay, the industrial sector. And, and the constructing regional advantages only exists uh, uh, exist because of the different stimulus that ex that that uh, are uh, that exist around the knowledge of uh, the flow of knowledge involving these different actors and the way they interact with each other, and in this context, uh, there are two dimensions on this on this on this. Uh, interactive learning process and knowledge flows. One that is related means that the knowledge are, are, have some similarities, uh, um, that this related knowledge, if we focus on, on the on the specific and industrial activity that exchanges knowledge with the other kind of, of, of industrial in which some of the producing processes or some of the raw materials are, the, are similar. So they take an advantage from the way they know how to 
transform certain certain products or place them in the market and there is other uh, forms of, uh, of of knowledge exchange that are more unrelated and and uh, and eventually are less uh, implicit uh, so is, is for example within the region you will have uh, uh, activities that are related to to poultry for example or to 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 cattle production and uh, eventually we will also have activities that are more related to 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 not necessarily heavy engineering but they embrace other activities that are completely not related to the to agriculture products for instance yet they can still exchange some knowledge in a way that can lead to or new uh, branches of activities, new business models uh, within that region. So the problem here in this context is very difficult to come up with a with a concrete example. It's still very much a theoretical discussion. There are examples, but I, in my perspective and, and based on the research I have conducted in this topic specifically, they remain short in terms of providing you concrete examples of how unrelated activities, those that are in which in which the, the the mechanisms the, the the routines that exist are completely different how they can learn from each other yet the concept of unrelated variety suggests that they can still learn from each other in a way that can support this advantage of uh, of a region and uh, and uh, everything is about or specialization or ways of uh, of how specialization or diversification of activities lead to innovation and eventually grow so again as in the other concepts there are part uh, some researchers suggest that specialized labor is the responsible to is, is the prime responsible to innovation process and eventually to grow others suggest that diversify the economic structures diversify the regional structures will lead more intensively to innovation and grow Again, what the uh, uh, concept of re constructing regional advantage suggests is that both are to be accounted for when we discuss how to build, how to construct a regional advantage in a, how to construct an advantage in one region. Both specialized labor is needed, different types of knowledge are needed, diversity. Uh, within the economic landscape is also needed because triggers new ideas and and leads to new uh, uh, needs to new flows of knowledge or knowledge spillovers as commonly defined in this in this context so to truly support regional development what the concept tells us that we need uh, we should not neglect regional specialization, more specific with tacit knowledge. I will tell you about this. And uh, we also need diversity. That's the, 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 the genesis of the variety uh, within the concept of related and unrelated variety is regarding with this diversity. So we need specialization and diversity to reach, uh, 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 to, to support regional development in a specific territory. I'm looking forward to reach the example so we can we can better grasp these elements. So we talk about innovation, regional development uh, or regional grow, if you will, in which knowledge, knowledge plays a role. And we make here a distinction between the, uh, there are different types or the, the, the conceptualization of the constructing regional advantage makes a distinction between different types of knowledge. Not only explicit knowledge, this knowledge that results from, from, from an understanding of processes, results from, from written documents, but also the tacit, tacit knowledge, this knowledge that is the result of the experience, the expertise of, uh, of in this context of labor force, of ourselves, me and you, in the in the context of the society, results of of these intangible values, intangible assets, the values, the attitudes, attitudes to entrepreneurship, for example, uh, capacity of dealing uh, dealing with an idea is is in many in many in many cultures that are that are we can tell okay. You, you cannot measure that if, if one if one community is full of ideas, how, how you assess this is through or new businesses, entrepreneurship, the re registration, we talk about this also, registration of patents, for example. So there's, there's a way still to understanding how they deal with this idea by then assessing how these ideas uh, led to uh, new business models or new new startups, for example. And, uh, and uh, uh, both in this context, construction regional advantage brings this specialization brings the diversity from unrelated variety, brings different types of knowledge together 
to understanding how to uh, to to uh, to construct to develop this advantage within within a region and the concept of constructing regional advantage brings together both these different types of, of knowledge um, brings the policy platforms as the slide earlier suggested which implies working together with 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 overarching governance structures public and private actors and the the related and unrelated and unrelated uh, specialization and diversity within uh, firms and industries more specifically related variety and unrelated variety okay this may sounds at the moment more overwhelming and i'm really looking forward to reach the, the example to see if we can better grasp this so related variety tells us that defines as, as as defined as a diversity of firms and sectors in the region that could complement each other it's very much uh, uh, an, uh, um, the definition is 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 is, is, is implicit in the term itself. So it's related knowledge that complements each other. There's, there are some, some, some similarities in this, in this, in the way, or they, in the way they, 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 they embrace the industrial process, the production process, or the distribution concept, the dimensions of the economic landscape, and and uh, within related variety there are. Uh, um, exchanges that complement each other. The, the exchange of knowledge between firms or between industrial sectors lead, complement each other and eventually lead to, to or new kind of activities or to the renewal of activities within that, that sector. And in both, the idea is that this, this related variety will sustain uh, will help to sustain uh, a region in the long term and make them gain an advantage in comparison to others. The unrelated variety is is more challenging to grasp, and there is no one size fitting all, and there is no one core definition for unrelated variety. And basically, is about is basically about exchange of knowledge. So, suggest the definition of unrelated variety tells us that that still exchange of knowledge exists still uh, exist within a region although they are not directly related well it's simply the opposite of related variety uh, uh, um, in a common sense uh, outside of economical uh, geography realm will suggest well what i know is completely different than what you know and i don't think that the way i i, I embrace this specific activity can complement with yours. So we are completely unrelated here. What the literature suggests, based on examples, is that, well, we, they can still learn, although the knowledge is slightly different, that can, combinations of knowledge can exist, that eventually will lead to this, or no, new paths, new, new business, and, um, and uh, overall, this will help to secure uh, employment rates and will help to uh, uh, support regional development and, regi and regional growth. So knowledge is essential in both related, being complementary, or being completely uh, opposed, yet combinations can still occur. Different types of knowledge that exist within economic geography. And then that, that if you then explore one of these concepts, you have to also be reminded these different types of knowledge primarily three types of knowledge one that is analytical or science based knowledge and more that we, that that is commonly called the know why this is more related with scientific knowledge um, the, 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 the scientific laws that result from long term theorization of concepts you know there's different the, the darwin law different the, the related relative the, the different kind of theories that that exist behind economic geography so this is, is the, the type of knowledge that results from long-term research within a specific field so and and then is translated to production processes and distrib and, uh, and distribution and there is the engineering based knowledge is more about the know-how know how to do the things know how to embrace a problem problem solving attitude how to 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 um, how to interact with uh, customers, with suppliers in a way that help or favors favors uh, uh, production process or turns them to be more more uh, cost competitive, for example. So there is a, an understanding of this process which is placed within this more engineering based uh, knowledge. And there is then the, the arts based concept that goes close with this tacit knowledge that we know uh, that we discussed earlier is the know who know who 
he's able to deal with his specific task uh, is about uh, is, is about more intangible and, and and symbolical elements that to some extent are also useful in the in the with, within economic landscape because they can lead to to new ideas they impact the creativity process and the creativity process although it requires these institutions and governance support can lead to uh, to innovation and innovation leads to new technologies eventual new technology will lead to and to these regions to enter a development a development path however this art space it can be more connected with a tacit knowledge the knowledge that we all know about how to to, to fix some specific issues in our household or around ourselves it ours it's also the result of 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 a lot of experimentation so there is still a linkage between partly or the applicability of a scientific knowledge of a, or or partly of engineering knowledge so they should also be placed in an overarching perspective if you focus on one you should not neglect the other because one can influence the other also the know who will certainly and and, and this capacity this capacity of experimenting of of uh, of of bringing uh, uh, our own own uh, own um own, own assets and, and and ideas how to deal with an issue can also and certainly influence the scientific discovery and scientific uh, uh, scientific process that are placed within the scientific knowledge so we reach here uh, an example and and uh, i'm going through i will go through the example and then i will uh, i will come to you and ask if you have questions in this in this uh, in this concept so this is the result of my own research i focus in uh, i take the concept of construct and regional advantage related and unrelated variety and i place it in in the iberian peninsula and more specifically in the cross border area northern portugal and galicia so northern portugal within portugal as a country and northern galicia uh, autonomous community of spain uh, just to position yourselves within geographical con in the geographical context the main cities in northern portugal are uh, porto braga and guimarães and the largest cities in a, in a, in galicia are coruña santiago de compostela a very popular tourism destination logo and vigo a port city with an intensive activity industrial activity so this was a pioneer study, which brings this constructing regional advantage to a region that is is we call is a soft space. So this is although there is an institution in charge, in formal, uh, formally in charge of this territory, uh, they both they had, they have different languages. They are they are, they are uh, uh, embraced by different governance contexts. They have different kind of autonomous in terms of decision making and policy making capacities. However, as part of the European Union uh, cohesion policy, that is an institution in charge of the regional dynamics within this territory, which justify the approach I taken to understand how we can think how we can construct regional advantage within within this common territory and in parts they are only separated by a natural element by a river uh, we have northern portugal in this side and galicia in this and in, uh, in, in the other side so how we can think uh, about a regional advantage in this cross border area and how these institutions okay i'm and then i try to place my findings within an institutional with with the ongoing debates and an institutional uh, uh, domain how we can think about this regional advantage when we have uh, a specific um, a specific uh, institutional background so based on case study work which is very important to underline here which included in-depth uh, interviewing as well as content analysis of policy documents coming from different uh, different domains national government of portugal national government spain regional governments of uh, of galicia there is no regional government in portugal so there is already an institutional difference in this context and documents from the european union i place it uh, the relatedness so related variety and unrelated variety in a, a in a in a theoretical framework supporting this construction of a uh, uh, of a uh, cross-border advantage in northern portugal and galicia and i try to explore the different types of knowledge with this discuss within this specific context and what kind of policy platforms exist that can that can hinder or facilitate constructing this this uh, uh, related this uh, this advantage within the related uh, uh, variety 
I bring the diversity of firms that exist within uh, within this region. Some of them they share competences. Others of them they they they, they are competitors competitors within that specific specific region and they they all together they try to position themselves in the market and uh, there is uh, there exists also a number of unrelated variety uh, uh, that is uh, that is a different uh, uh, asymmetrical uh, developments within the region there are different different uh, uh, different measures also also to 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 assess the economic performance of both regions so there's a number of disparities on how they embrace all economic developments how they embrace uh, employment uh, how they deal with uh, with the uh, dynamics in the, in the industrial context so elements that we will come to to conclude where they are completely disparate we cannot work together so i tr we try to i try to bring them in the this within the unrelated variety concept. And then I explore the, the, the scientific basis, try to identify what kind of uh, universities, if they are more research oriented, if they are more oriented towards towards practice, what kind of, of subjects they explore. I try to understand more the, the influence of this context, specific, specific activities that exist, what type of, of uh, industries this, uh, exist in both regions and also try to grasp a little bit these cultural and community slash community elements that exist that can lead, that can support the development, that, that can, can lead to constructing a cross-world advantage. And I try to understand what kind of policy platforms that can, can help in this context. Government, national governments, regional governments, European uh, European institutions, although with a they, although they lack decision-making capacity in terms of bringing about some change. So, and identify, again, through this case study work, different kind of activities in both territories, Galicia and Northern Portugal. Uh, be this based on a content analysis of, uh, uh, of, of a specific policies, in this case, the joint investment program for Galicia and Northern Portugal. While Galicia is focused on fishing and Northern Portugal in the sea economy, I try to build some cross-border relatedness uh, um, you can find different parallelism in terms of knowledge. Also, knowing knowing uh, uh, the activity of fishing is certainly very related with activities that you can develop within the sea, within the, the, the within the sea economy. Eventually, all together, they can position the region all together as Galicia, Northern Portugal, as a single region in sea-oriented activities. These can go from fishing to energy production. They can explore seafood industry by combining more the uh, industrial knowledge that exists in northern Portugal with a more tacit knowledge of the fishing from Galicia. And then I try to also develop this in another context by bringing, for instance, here just pinpointing some examples. The focus on culture and natural heritage from Galicia certainly can be related with the investments that are that 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 the program forecasts for the culture tourism in northern Portugal. They all together can explore uh, common pilgrimage routes, for example, those routes that that uh, that uh, that are, uh, the the San James routes, for example, very very popular in Spain. Can also think about them by starting by starting in in northern Portugal, for example. So they can combine a number of activities that will help to enhance their potentials, the culture and, and natural heritage of Galicia with the potential of cultural tourism in Northern Portugal. I hope this is uh, making some sense. What's happened here, and it also happens in other regions, that many of these, of these focus areas or primary economic domains, strategic areas of these territories, they are the result of, of uh, different kind of discourses. Uh, and to some extent, the critic here is that while Galicia somehow is more uh, embraces this more tacit knowledge approach by calling it fishing, the Northern Portugal authorities, while contributing to this overall document, decided to to call it something different. And in the end, is about fishing, but maybe not only capturing fish from the sea, but complementary activities. So they call it the sea economy, the number of activities that can be built around fishing. Eventually, uh, there, there are a number of uh, of uh, a number of activities that are not only related with fishing, but uh, but uh, but uh, fishing is fundamental to support to support them, and others related with the 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 the, the, the potentials in terms of uh, of energy production or green biotechnology can be combined with the investments that are that are taking place within the footwear, the textile and footwear industry in northern Portugal, and eventually, all together, if they combine the knowledge, if they exchange knowledge uh, uh, between 
this type of industries they can position themselves in a tech uh, in a in a tactile Te technical textile oriented region by investing in tech in tech technical sportswear and workwear and then build a, a regional advantage so a summary so i developed this theoretical framework in the beginning through the case study work and i bring and i bring the insights from from the from the interviewees and also from the policy documents trying to understand the basis or the pillars of this cross-border advantage in Galicia, Northern Portugal. And so I put uh, the related variety, a number of activities that, that can, that are more prone to exchange knowledge and also others in which uh, it doesn't seem very, very, very implicit that they can exchange knowledge such as between science and textile and trying to argue that they can still uh, knowledge combinations of knowledge they can still occur in the way that will support the, uh, the will support the, the an advantage of the region uh, try to identify the different types of, of knowledge that exist nanotechnology uh, technical textiles that are already embedded in both regions the engineering one with arts based one these more, more intangible elements that can 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 uh, support can support the development of new partnerships across industries they can lead to solidify this triple helix so the interconnections between universities industrial sector and the institutional sectors the overall the overarching governance uh, governance structures and I, w I went beyond the economic activities by pointing out that uh, the combination of these different types of knowledge and with the support from specific uh, policy platforms, being them or the national government, regional governments and the European Union can also solidify uh, a regional identity as understanding to the point of understanding Northern Portugal and Galicia as a common territory. And this is fundamental to boost to, to, to boost a sense of belonging to this region, which then can lead to further combinations of knowledge and eventually lead to new uh, development development paths through innovation or technolo technological development. And, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, beside this regional identity, I pointed out ways in which this combination of specialization, specialized activities, uh, diversity and knowledge can help the region to position itself in the competitive, uh, in the competitive market, or against other regions in central, in uh, within the European Union, for example. Okay, this was a, a real nice exercise, and hopefully helps to conciliate the concepts. But you can ask me. So, what about the policy impact of this work of mine in constructing cross-border advantage? That is the result. Is nothing. This may come as a disappointment, but also I've done tons of efforts to convey this message through conferences, through through uh, publication of uh, short uh, articles in, in, in non-academic uh, uh, platforms, then which still these, uh, these regions are still lagging behind. Uh, there's still a lot of investments taking place, place that are not building on the exchange of knowledge. Uh, there is a lot of selfishness uh, as well and, uh, and uh, misapplicability of uh, European, uh, Union found, uh, European Union founding as well. So the policy impact, uh, although as, as a researcher, is not my role to, to really influence the policies directly by shaping these courses, but trying to convey a message of the of, of of the advantage of combining these different types of knowledge at this stage and the work was already conducted five years ago the still the impact is really is really uh, reduced there are other examples and the time now is is coming to an end there are other examples that i can bring them in the next lecture to recap in italy for example in emilia romana that after the second world war they use this embedded knowledge to Build to to build uh, 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 to develop new business and new activities. There are also examples from Germany in which they underline the difference between related and unrelated knowledge. In this specific case, they suggest that within within Germany that they privilege the related knowledge that exists because they, it gives them a, a, a more more security of the investment. So the, so there is a focus on the related variety. So a focus on exploring knowledge that is very similar because of the risk aversion of some German managers and venture capitalists. So findings from this, 
from this uh, article uh, article here and they suggest that okay related variety will lead to to, to uh, can lead to new uh, new in, to innovations and new developments but it's necessary to also invest in unrelated knowledge and they suggest that this can also lead to the development of uh, of uh, different activities and uh, to conclude that the constructing regional advantage requires a context specific analysis uh, is, is is not a magic solution to build to, to 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 place a region in a new development path but provides insights mainly those related with exploring different types of knowledge provides insights on how to build this this advantage within a region so um, the time the time is up and i still want to to open the open the discussion to you if you have a, if you have some question at this stage neil uh, yes, uh, thank you for the lecture. It was very interesting, especially the CRA uh, concept approach. But I, um, and the framework you did in 2015 is very uh, in, um, interesting to look into. But I was uh, wondering, you only presented us framework and sort of um, words and analysis, but do you have concrete uh, statistical or uh, map based? Um, images or diagrams that can present the whole um, advantage of the uh, northern Portugal and uh, northern Spain region in a more mm -hmm. like geographic way. I was, it would be very interesting mm -hmm. to see like a map-based approach to, con uh, to grasp these uh, advantage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't have is not included in that uh, in that uh, publication of mine from 20, 2015. I don't have uh, beside the uh, Beside the, the, uh, the this this map, which doesn't tell you anything about this advantage, uh, I don't have. But I can bring I can bring something further, or how I envisioning, for example, this specific uh, sub region here of how I am envisioning the exchange with a, with a, with a, with a Galicia. So I can I can place. Uh, place that findings in a more geographical context. It is very important to do that, and it's often neglected within economic geography, bringing this more, uh, placing your findings in a, in, a, in a map to translate what I'm talking about in terms of this knowledge. I don't have at the moment, but I can bring it uh, one or two examples in the next lecture, focus specifically, or for example, on, on textile, technical textile, which I, 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 I have a better knowledge and identify you where one Research institution is currently doing research that supports a number of technical of, of uh, textile industries in the region. Then I can try to underline these flows of knowledge that exist. Yeah, I will bring that in the in the as a recap of the next lecture next year. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. But be aware that also in this in these other publications, and this is a very is is a good a good point that Neil pointed out here, that you see this is a more quantitative work. This one focus on related and related variety in German, and then you will find very dense tables in terms of a quanti quantitative assessment, which is not my. Uh, I'm not that comfortable with the quantitative approach. I'm a qualitative researcher, but they also neglect mapping uh, mapping the possible knowledge exchanges across uh, across Germany that can lead to these radical innovations in this context. It's very difficult to find such, an, such examples in within economic geography, I must say. Okay, I'll try to bring one on, the, on the, these examples. The next lecture, which is, is, is important also to, 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 and will pave the way for the discussion on a place based at the regional policies, uh, very much uh, EU related concepts and, uh, and, uh, and very much related with what we just discussed about uh, constructing regional advantage, which requires this context specific analysis. So thank you so much for listening. Enjoy the rest of the week and, uh, and uh, the holiday on Thursday. And I'll see you next, uh, next Tuesday for the next lecture. Thank you for coming and thank you for watching later at home. So all the best. Goodbye. Bye-bye.